Our speaker is our own Reverend John. And all I'm going to ask you to do is to just open your ears and your hearts and have your pen ready to, put, to, to note the assignment that will certainly be given to you. And it's a good thing because it allows you to, to learn a little bit more than you, you would. Reverend John, please come forward. Good morning, family. Open your ears, open your heart, and above all, open your mind. Good morning, and welcome to the Temple of Light, and welcome to those joining us on the World Wide Web. What a lovely morning it is. Is that me or the Mac? Escape. Temple member Doug O'Rain, who was here with us this morning, hi Doug, has said that he comes to our center to fill up his spiritual gas tank. And I recently had an experience which really gave meaning to what he says. So I want to thank him for the inspiration for this morning's encouragement. A couple of Wednesdays ago, my gas gauge indicated that I had a quarter tank of petrol. Now I have an unwritten rule for myself. You know you make up these little rules for yourself that whenever my gas tank is on quarter, I go to the gas station and fill it up. But you know, Wednesday is my Sabbath, it's my day off and I didn't feel like spending my Sabbath in such a mundane activity as going to a petrol filling station. So I said, okay, early on Thursday morning, I will tank up. And you know, there's a theory that if you tank up early in the morning, um, it's better you get more gas because in the heat of the day, you get vapor. I don't know how true it is, but I tend to, to go um, early in the morning anyhow. But Thursday morning, I was running late for our 10 o'clock staff prayers here at the temple, so I said, okay, I'll go Thursday evening on the way home from work. On Thursday evening, I had a really busy day, and I, the car knows its way home, so although I had in my mind to go to the petrol filling station, the car turned up Devon Road of its own free will and volition, and I said, it's okay, um, Friday morning. On Friday morning, I'd quite forgotten that I had promised to go at 8 o'clock to Mona, um, to disarm the, the security system of a friend who was abroad and who was expecting a plumber to come and do some really urgently needed work. You know how that goes. And if you miss the plumber, you have to wait again another six weeks or six months. So as, the, as soon as the phone rang, I said, I'm on my way. And I headed up to, to Mona to do that um, labor of love for my friend. So I got there all right, all the time. By now, you know, the gas gauge is not flickering. It's, it's beaming like the star of Bethlehem, you know, to show you which part the baby born. And I have to force myself not to stare at it. You know, it's, it's hypnotic, you know. So I'm, I'm chanting divine order, divine order, divine order. And I get to Mona and disarm the security system and let the recalcitrant plumber in. And he does his work and then I rearm the system and I'm heading down now to the nearest gas station. And as I turn into the petrol filling station, my car just sputtered, and I literally coasted to a stop by the pump. Before I could even, the fellow said, how much you want? <laughs> so I fished out a little notepad in my glove compartment, and I wrote the title of my talk, How Far Can You Go On Empty? <laughs> my friends, when we neglect our spiritual work, we are like that empty gas tank. Sometimes, even when we come on a Sunday, like Doug says, to fill up, our mind is on other things, and we only take half a tank. And guess what happens? In the middle of the week, we find we're running out again. Ever happened to you? Yeah. It's just you're running on empty, or in danger of running on empty. And so, if you feel as though you are running on empty this morning, you need to establish the habit of daily preparing your mind to receive God's good. The Science of Mind textbook tells us, and I quote, the mode of acceptance is the measure of our experience. The infinite fills all molds and forever flows into new and greater ones, but we have to provide the mold. So this is the first lesson I want us to remember this morning, because we have a gas tank, but unless you fill up, 
the vehicle isn't going anywhere. Sometimes, you know, just think of it. God can't give you what God has for you, and God has everything you could possibly want. But you have to make the decision to tank up, to fill her up. And so this week, friends, I want you to take time. I know you do it all the time, but I want you to be specially mindful of filling your gas tank, your spiritual gas tank, to take time for God. And that brings me to your assignment, right up front. Regulars at the Temple of Light know I always give an assignment. No, I give it, I give it, I give it any time. I have to catch you, Cassandra, because I never know. So, your mission, should you decide to undertake it, my friends and family, is this week to take several what I call power pauses. Now, I know we have the CEO of the power company with us, I, and it's not a good thing in their, in their world, power pauses. So, sir, I wish to just re, uh, reassure you that this is a metaphysical power pause. And Sandra is sitting beside you. She will tell me later if you can sing, and we will look for, look for you on Wednesday. <laughs> so, the power pause is really very simple. All you need to do several times during the day, as often as you, as you, you remember or you feel, the, you feel the, the need for it, is to stop. Put everything out of your hands, take three deep centering breaths, and just silently say to yourself, fill me up, God. Then as you open your eyes, say out loud, thank you, God, now I'm good to go. So can we try that right now? Let's have a little practice. Take three deep centering breaths at your own pace. and say, fill me up, God. Now open your eyes and say, thank you, God. Now I'm good to go. You know, speaking of being filled with God, feeding on God, feasting on God, I have to confess that I've always been puzzled by the strange idiom of the Gospel of John. I think it's John chapter 6 which reports Jesus as saying to his listeners, and I quote, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you, unquote. I used to think this is a very strange and slightly macabre thing for the, you know, the leader of, uh, of thought, <laughs> human and the discovery of human um, divinity to say. And I wondered about it until I came across um, some writings by the Aramaic scholar Roka Eriko, who explains it. And I thought I'd share it with you because it's very interesting. Eriko says that among the Semites who speak northern Aramaic, one often hears them say, I have eaten my body and drunk my blood. And that means that they ha have worked to the point of exhaustion. Now, the, the Semitic peoples have a tradition of very flowery and colorful language. They speak in beautiful metaphors. And so that's one of them. And so when Jesus was talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, what he was really saying was, you have to embody what I'm teaching. He didn't mean literally that you were to um, do what the suggestion, and it was quite a macabre suggestion for my eight and nine year old mind at the time. It meant that we should follow his teaching. Doesn't that make sense? And they still use it evidently nowadays. They will say, if, if they have had a real hardship, they will say, I have eaten the flesh and drunk the blood of my ancestors, meaning that, you know, really I am in the struggle. So um, I just thought you might find that interesting. The truth which we are called to feed upon and digest, so to speak, so that it becomes flesh of our flesh, my friends, is that we are by nature divine. I say that every time I speak because it's so important that we get that fixed in our spiritual gas tank. We are divine. We, if we tend to excuse our foibles and our mistakes by saying, well, I'm only human. But that's not true. You are only divine. 
And that is the truth of you and of all humanity. But it's a choice we have to make. The Gospel of John um, says, and I quote, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not, unquote. And John was referring to the world of our own thinking, because in our thoughts we have to choose if we want to fill up on the negatives and what is wrong with Jamaica and what is wrong with the world, or we want to fill up on the positives of what is beautiful about Jamaica and about the world and all the good that God has in store for everyone in 2020, year are plenty. And so I just want us to bear that in mind because the God potential within us is there waiting for us to just lift up our cups of acceptance, lift up our, our consciousness and say, fill me God, fill me with everything. Fill me with your love, fill me with your laughter, fill me with your joy, fill me with your, your life. Because that's what it's all about, my friends. It's about tanking up and living to your fullest potential. But it's choice. Now, I want to tell you a story that uh, happened to me last Tuesday at what I call the University of Tower Street, the general penitentiary, the, the prison to which I go on a Tuesday. We started a new cohort last week. And I had 16 men. And at that course of 12 weeks, the, the opening exercise is a very powerful exercise about choice. And what I do is I put in the center of the floor, you know, we're sitting in a circle. I put in the center of the floor pairs of objects, just random objects I've chosen. Um, I put into that, into that circle um, two stones, two feathers, two candles, two markers, two bulldog clips, two rubber bands, uh, just objects, random objects. Oh, and I'm seeing one of my officers right now sitting at the back. Wonderful, welcome. As I mentioned, my university experience, one of the correctional officers. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> Both, wait, Mr. Watson is here too. You recognize him out of uniform. Very good. Two of our correctional officers, welcome. Three, wow. <laughs> oh, no, Tyler, let me say you're not good. <laughs> Tyler, let me say you're good. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Wow. Well, they can be on me out and say on a line that I tell you about last Tuesday. <laughs> Very good. In that group, there's a rather distinguished looking gentleman, one of the participants. And he left himself for last. Well, first of all, when I put the objects on the ground, I tell them that they have to, the task is, the job is, they have to pick up one of the objects that they think says something about their personality, what kind of ways they have, what kind of person they are. And so people choose the candle or the flower or whatever, you know. And then when I say the word go, they have to pick up their object and go back to their seat. So the, one of the first lessons is, it's just two of each object. So what happens if three men want the same thing that you want? And then the conversation ensues. Well, what you do when somebody have, have what you want, be it an object or a lady, and you then, well, then walk away with your thing. What you do, hold down and take away, lick them down, or, and before you could say anything, this distinguished looking gentleman said, or choose again. Mm. So first lesson about choice, we can choose. So when I said the word go, they all scrambled to pick up their objects, but he sat and he waited. And when they had all chosen, some people get what they wanted, some people don't, and we, we, you know, we can process that and look at what we learn from that and learn that sometimes when you don't get what you want, what you get turns out to be better. So we do all of that. He got up very, very slowly, went and he picked up a big rock. And again, he left himself, because they each have to say their name again so I can learn it and why they chose the particular object. He left himself for last again. And when it was his time to speak, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, you know, I chose this object because it is a symbol of strength, the rock. He said, you know, this rock could be used to destroy, come boss your head, 
or it can be used to build a lovely cut stone wall. He said, I came into this prison when I was 25, and I am 58 now. I spent the first 10 years on death row, and then another, I forget how many years, at South Camp Road, and now I'm here. And he said, I think I have the respect of, of inmates and officers, and I could choose to use what might appear as privilege and power to live a certain kind of life. But I have chosen to be an example to others here of how they can find the path back to peace. You know, may I try hard enough for ball, and Mr. Watson still on beside me, you know, <laughs> and Mr. Roberts, you know. They are always present, and they are wonderful because they are so supportive of the program, and they add their own wisdom and their own experience. But it was such a powerful moment, you know, and he said, I choose. And then he ended by saying, I said, so, you know, I said, why he didn't choose a candle, you know? Because every time somebody says what they've chosen, we do a little, little discussion around it. You know, if, you're, if they chose the flower, uh, you like the flower, you bloom everywhere for everybody, regardless of who they are and what they've done. You know, there's a little learning in each object that we can extract. I said, why he didn't choose the light? He said, well, yes, you know, I could have chosen any of the objects because I recognize that there's a little bit of everybody. As I listen, there's a little bit of everybody in me. Wow. I felt if come sit down side of me because you can teach the class, you know. Yeah. Reverend Michael has not been able to be there um, for the last year because of the demands of his teaching um, duties. But in almost every class, we have somebody who could sit beside me and co-facilitate. And so he said, yeah, I could have chosen the candle, but you know, the candle melts. But the rock is eternal. And he said, I want you to know, just listen to this, friends. I, this is somebody who has been incarcerated for a long time. That's 29 years or something, if my math is right. He said, I want you to know that the center of this rock is a vein of gold. Is a vein of gold, and it might suit you to do some mining. To do some mining, mine for the gold. And you know, friends, when we meet people that, may, that maybe we, we spirit in a tech, as we say in Jamaica, sometimes you know, we recoil something about their behavior or their dress or their mannerisms or whatever repels you. It may be good just to remind yourselves that at the center of every single human being is a vein of gold. And so when you're running on empty and you feel like, boy, I'm on earth, I'm going to make it to the next stop, just remind yourself that all that God has for you is already provided. And all you need to do is to pull up to the filling station and say, fill me up, God. And it can happen. Sometimes when I don't have enough money, I can only put in $1,000 of 90. But you never have to have any money or any resources to just say, fill me up. Come to me and just let fill me from the inside out till I'm saturated with the glory, with the goodness, with the joy, with the love and with the infinite wisdom of the Almighty that is our birthright by divine right of being. And so this principle, my friends, of the Christ indwelling is a very important thing to fill up on. And we know that the Christ is not Jesus' last name. He didn't name Jesus Christ like I named John Scott. Christ was the principle of divinity that he discovered. It's the principle of your sonship and your daughtership with the divine, whatever you conceive that to be. And when you fill up on it, you really are empowered to do and to be and to experience all the good that you deserve and that you want and that you dream of in your lives. And I know that the center of your being is a vein of gold. So if you will allow me, I will mine for it because there's, it's an inexhaustible supply of God's goodness and God's love and God's joy. 
Eric Butterworth, the new thought luminary, says that, in his opinion, the attaining of this Christ consciousness, the finding of this vein of gold, is a long-range goal, and that we're not going to achieve this divine fulfillment in a day or a year, or sometimes even in a lifetime, but I disagree. It can happen right here, right now, today because the, the divine doesn't know anything about time. That's a construct that we have made. Once you open yourself to receive that goodness, that Christness, that godness that is yours, it can be yours all the way, without hesitation, without delay. Just say, fill me up. Let's say, fill me up, God. Yes. Say it in a half voice. Fill me up, God. Say it in, your, in a whisper. Fill me up, God. And say it in your heart. So if you find yourself running on empty this week, wandering aimlessly through life and wondering why you are here and what your life will have meant when it comes time to exchange this vehicle for a newer, finer model, I invite you to join us here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living where you can fill up with God every time you come through the door and where you can learn the techniques. Our spiritual fuel is prayer. And God, the Christ consciousness, is the additive that we put into our spiritual gas tank to strengthen us and to help us achieve the heights of spiritual self-actualization that all of us yearn for on this journey called life. There's a, a First Nation American whose name is Oyesha. He's a Plains Indian whose Anglo-Saxon name was Charles Alexander Eastman. And he was the first First Nation American to get, go to medical school. And he wrote a book in 1911 titled The Soul of the Indian. Eastman explains that to the indigenous peoples, everything is full of God. You know that the, the, the First Nation people, they see God in everything, the, the, the mountains and the trees and blades of grass and grains of sand. And so he writes about this. And he recommends filling up with what he calls the unseen. That's what he calls God. Um, by rising to meet the morning sun, by practicing gratitude for all things, and by seeing all life as sacred. To the Indian, the most important daily duty was prayer and the regular recognition of and thanksgiving for life. That way, they ensure that, ne that they never run out of the spiritual fuel that empowers the trees and the stars and indeed the life of all creation. So friends, however long the journey takes, I assure you that along the way, there is freedom for us and abundant, joyous living. The important thing is to be faced in the right direction and moving on a full spiritual tank. So let's take a power pause right now, and again take three deep centering breaths. And silently say to yourself, fill me up God, fill me up with your love, fill me with your light, fill me with your life. Fill me with your laughter. And take another deep breath and say out loud, thank you, God, now I'm good to go. Thank you, God, now I'm good to go. You see, this is what keeps your carburetor carving and your piston um, working well. <laughs> so if you're on the journey with me, check your shock absorbers, because <laughs> it may be a bumpy ride. Friends, my prayer for you all is that you will just live your life filled to the brim and overflowing with the goodness of God this year. God loves you and so do I. You're good to go. Namaste. <laughs>